for me now, Hilan. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. We'll wait another couple of minutes and then we'll get going. It's nice to see everybody showing up. Good morning, Sarah Keller. Good morning, Avi. Good morning, Navish, Jan, Gorowitz. Haven't seen you in a while. Joe Howard, good morning. <laughs> Matt Holmes, hi, I'll talk to you later. All right, people are rushing in. Fools rush in and grab the best seats. That's what I always say. Good morning, everybody that's just arriving. We're going to wait one more minute and then we'll get started. You're tomorrow, it should be, right? Gotcha. Okay. I think we'll get started. There might still be a few stragglers coming in, but um, welcome to today's talk for Physical Biology of the Cell. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, El Mahadavan, affectionately and commonly known as Maha, here to talk to us. So as usual, I'll give a few of the factual things that you might want to know, and then I uh, have some more personal comments. So Maha is a professor at Harvard University in uh, applied math, organismic and evolutionary biology and also in physics. And uh, for those of you that know him, that makes total sense. And for those of you that don't know him yet, uh, I think by the end of the talk, you'll see why that does indeed make sense. And I mean that in the best sense of the word, you know, he's got very Catholic interests. His undergrad was done at uh, the IIT Madras in India. And then he uh, came to Stanford University where he got his PhD working with a legend, uh, Joe Keller, who uh, those of you that were at MBL actually, would have seen Joe on the beach uh, at MBL because he was there most days because he was always uh, there and would hold for the geophysical or I forgot what it's called, but the, the fluid dynamics um, summer schools that take place in this wonderful little building about a few blocks away from MBL. If you haven't been there before, uh, you've missed out. But anyway, Joe was a was a, a an every year contributor there and. Um, a very, very clever guy who did super interesting stuff. Um, I always just felt I was uh, so lucky to be in his uh, presence. Um, Maha's professorial trajectory has taken him from MIT to uh, the University of Cambridge, where he was um, at DAMPT, which is the shoot Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. I don't remember if it's, I don't know what D stands for, but it doesn't matter. And after that, he, uh, he came to Harvard, maybe in around 2003 or something. Um, I, I guess I want to say that, you know, he's won all sorts of honors like the MacArthur Award, but um, I actually am especially fond of when people win the Ig Nobel Prize and, uh, and Maha won that. And for those of you who don't know about it, I really encourage you today to go search for Ig Nobel Prizes. You know, another one I think was Ray Goldstein won one for uh, looking at how women's ponytails bobble when they're, when they're walking. And Mahas did one on uh, things like wrinkling of curtains. And so, you know, the idea here is it's kind of interesting because on the one hand, they're a little bit making fun of the weirdness of the problem, but at the same time, they're also saying, you know, how that's really cool what the person figured out. So, uh, so I salute that. Um, there's a lot of favorite papers for me that Maha has written. One of them is in American Journal of Physics. It's, uh, I don't know, it's probably pretty obscure and maybe many of you wouldn't have seen it, but it actually follows on his advisor's work on the randomness of coin flips and deterministic, what, the way I'd put it actually is hidden variables. If you, if you know the initial upward velocity and you know the initial angular rotation, you can work out whether or not you'll get a heads or a tails and Ma had a really nice treatment of that. Um, another real favorite for me is a paper that he wrote, uh, which is a series of papers with Cliff Tabin and this one's about gut folding, but they did other stuff. Uh, I'm truly in love with that paper. You know, it's, it's a great paper, but the SI 
is a wonder to behold because it does important things like measure the radius of the gut tube. And uh, the reason that's important is because if you're going to do the theory experiment comparison, you have to know what the aerial moment of inertia is. And, you know, like it's just every single little thing you would have needed to think about, they did. And then uh, there's a nice uh, MBL connection because just recently uh, he had a paper with Nicole King and uh, Ben Larson, and Ben's been on these calls, uh, in, and it refers to a discovery that I think was made at MBL in the physiology course, having a very, very strange um, sort of shapes, shape transitions of coanoflagellates. So, um, you know, if you take a trip to Google Scholar, uh, I guess what I would say, if you look at Maha's publications, it's a dizzying way to honestly come by an inferiority complex, you know, and uh, what can I tell you? That's just the way it goes. So, you know, I'm going to embarrass, I think I can even embarrass Maha here, and this is very sincere. I'm not really that much of a fan, frankly, of uh, Darcy Thompson and on growth and form. I'm not, I, it just doesn't speak to me. I, I don't know, maybe it was ahead of its time, maybe it wasn't, but um, it, it's not one of my favorites, even though we just celebrated its 100th anniversary. But I would say, you know, that I really do believe that 100 years on, that Maha has really taken up the baton of precisely that subject and made it real uh, in a way that I am much more sympathetic to. So with that, you know, uh, it's said with complete and total sincerity, it's not some bullshit, excuse my language, but, um, you know, I really admire Maha, his creativity, his technical know-how, it's a lot of fun. He, uh, he he sees interesting things in the world and and hasn't lost his sense of wonder. And uh, I, I appreciate that very much. So anyway, I'll shut up now and uh, Maha, go for it. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say anything more. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So I, I, I recognize it is physiology of the cell. I'm not going to talk about cells at all. So I apologize, but I hope you will be able to see some connections to things that many of you do study on a completely different scale. Um, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about a problem or a class of problems that I've been thinking about for actually more than a decade now, very, very slowly, um, uh, which initially started out as most things do for most people as a game, but it may become serious one day if I ever grow up. Um, so the title has been borrowed, stolen, plagiarized from a wonderful book by Tom Seeley, who if you don't know, uh, you should. Uh, he's an entomologist. Uh, and uh, ecologist at Cornell, um, who written a book called The Wisdom of the Hives, talking about bees. Um, and I want to tell you something about wisdom of just not hives, but uh, nests and mounds. And, and I want to focus on a class of questions, which I hope, as I said, uh, you will see connections to in physiology on the very small scale, but here you can actually see this on a very grand scale, collective physiology and social insects. And I want to talk about two particular problems, one associated with termites and termite mounds, one of the great and grand architectures of the animal world. Um, and then I want to tell you something about problems associated with bees. Um, and I'll give you a vignette of each one of these, although there are many, many questions associated with both that I think we could keep ourselves busy with for many years. Uh, hence, so why uh, and, and what for uh, should we be interested in collective physiology of social insects? Um, so my own interest in this uh, was associated with a sim very simple question that I think everybody in physical biology of the cell uh, uh, is, is familiar with, uh, which is you know, the ability of cells, the ability of multicellular tissues, the ability of organisms, and the ability of, in fact, ecosystems to be able to control how you transfer energy, how you transfer matter, how you transfer uh, uh, um, uh, information from one part of the system to another part. Uh, um, excuse me. Sorry. Um, in a very uncertain environment. And the uncertain environment is the physical environment over here. And by the end of this talk, I'm going to, uh, I hope to be able to convince you that these boundaries between what is living and what is non-living, particularly in these kinds of questions, starts to blur, which I think is a very good thing. So you got to really think about the system collectively rather than individually or bit by bit. Um, and, and so the specific questions that I'd like to try and address uh, in, in, in the context of one physiological function, which I'll come to in a minute, is how is collective behavior constrained by physics, in this case, the physics of the environment, but also the physics associated with or organisms can sense and work with, uh, and uh, vice versa, how does physics essentially enable collective behavior, but I want to focus on function. There is, as I'm sure you are aware of, uh, substantial theoretical, primarily theoretical literature, although now experiments are gradually starting to catch up on, on this field, which is now known as active matter. Um, but most of it has focused on understanding what you actually see in terms of patterns. Uh, it's only very recently that people have started to think uh, 
uh, much more deeply uh, about problems which biologists have cared about for a lot, which is associated with function. And I want to focus on function over here, but I want to focus rather than active matter on the small scale. I want to think about if you want active organisms and how they essentially behave in the wild. Um, and these will involve experiments and some very, very elementary theory, which I hope to introduce you to. Why study insects? Um, um, so this is a recent phylogeny published a few years ago. Um, I think everybody over here is familiar with the fact that in fact, insects are the oldest and most specious animal group on our planet. Uh, they've been around for uh, close to half a billion years, uh, more than a million species and still counting. They occupy almost every ecological niche. Uh, they are seen of course in, on land in water, even in the air. Darwin actually reports seeing spiders off the coast uh, uh, of, of South America, he suspected that they were essentially ballooning uh, using their spider webs, uh, which are fantastic drag lines. Um, uh, so much so that when, in fact, uh, much later, one of the founders of mathematical genetics, Holden, was asked about what he thought was a plan that maybe God had, uh, he referred to insects and he said perhaps there was uh, someone who had an inordinate fondness for beetles. So insects essentially are a spectacular system that have conquered and occupy almost every ecological niche and therefore a wonderful source of questions associated with how they do so. How do they essentially handle this remarkable variability in the environment, whether it's on land and water or in the air. Um, instead of studying insects in general, one could start localizing much more on social insects of which there are four big categories, bees, wasps, ants, and termites. Uh, um, beautiful book again, if you haven't seen, uh, or if you have, I encourage you to pick it up and look at it again, because every time I do so, it's just a source of wonder, uh, is this book, Super Organisms. And so why social insects? Because they have this remarkable ability to essentially work collectively, uh, almost unlike anything else that's essentially been seen on our planet for such a long time. Uh, in particular, uh, these social insects have common nests. Uh, they have a reproductive division of labor. So there is a queen who's responsible primarily for essentially propagating. And then there are the workers who basically do almost everything else. Uh, there is cooperative brood care. Uh, so very collectively done. Again, this is very much from a biological point of view. And there is a sense of culture, if you want, associated with the fact that there are overlapping generations. So there is a, a tremendous amount of knowledge which can essentially be transmitted just because multiple generations exist at the same time. <clears throat> from a perspective that certainly I have come to appreciate these problems uh, is uh, associated with an analogy to multicellular organisms. Replace, if you want, cells by now bees, wasps, ants, or termites uh, working together to essentially now create complex architectures, recognizing how those complex architectures can allow for this uh, ability to build boundaries which are porous. Uh, so not completely insulating, but not completely open. Uh, and using these boundaries, which are architectures, to essentially control, as I said before, transfer of energy, information, and matter, and therefore solve uh, complex physiological problems, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, um, using patterns. Uh, so they're extraordinarily uh, uh, problem solvers, and the patterns essentially that they create, for example, this remarkable termite mound, which is a couple of meters tall, uh, ant nests, uh, uh, paper wasp nests, beehives, and so on. What do they do it for? Well. Um, again, for today, I want to focus on how they essentially use these structures to essentially harness, if you want, physics to solve problems in physiology. For example, problems of ventilation um, associated with large crowded areas, which essentially can become asphyxiating if you have too much carbon dioxide or very low carbon. oxygen. Uh, mechanical protection from prey, mechanical adaptation if I form a cluster, as you will see uh, later on, of bees uh, which are hanging off each other, and then from a the a thermal point of view, as temperature diurnally essentially varies, make sure that you can regulate temperature. Um, again, we have similar mechanisms in us uh, for ventilation. I'm using that right now for mechanical adaptation. I'm using an exoskeleton or endoskeleton, sorry, uh, over here. Uh, and of course, I have thermal regulation continuously. Uh, and the question is, how do you essentially do this? Do you have it working with a single uh, master regulator that essentially commands what happens everywhere? Or is it completely collective. In other words, essentially you have all information is broadcast and all decisions are made locally. <clears throat> okay, uh, I won't talk about all these different problems. I wanna talk about two problems, both of which focus on one physiological question and the physiological question is that associated with ventilation. So I wanna first tell you about uh, a study that's been going on now uh, for, and it's actually at the end pretty much uh, for about seven years, eight years now, uh, a passive ventilation of a termite mound. Um, I'll describe some field experiments that we started out uh, doing first in a uh, wildlife reservation in uh, uh, North um, 
East Namibia, uh, a couple of hours further north of Windhoek, uh, started about seven years ago or so. Uh, and then simultaneously, we did some experiments with a different species in a slightly different climb in, in Southern India in Bangalore. Um, and I'll describe essentially how we got to this. And, and the question is trying to understand the physiology of this object. Uh, so you see a bicycle in the back, this is a termite mound. The two halves essentially are showing what it looks like at night on the left side and during the day with an infrared camera. And I'll come back and explain this. And this is work that was started uh, by a postdoc, Hunter King, working with me, who's now on the faculty of the University of Akron, Sam Oko, who was a graduate student working with me. Now he's uh, switched to neuroscience and now I think he's in private industry and Alex Hyde who's a graduate student working with me currently in OEB. So that's a question of passive ventilation. And I will also describe an active aspect of this, which is how do they essentially build the mound? What is the process by which the mound is built? And again, I'll describe some simple experiments and simple theory that we're essentially working on. And then I'll switch to a different organism, another social insect rather than termites, bees. Uh, and I'll describe how instead of passive ventilation, bees essentially use active ventilation, um, which is seen in hives. Uh, uh, but here the experiments were done in uh, uh, location very close to us. Uh, Harvard owns something called the Concord Field Station where you can do experiments with bees and even termites. Uh, they won't allow either one of these things on campus. Uh, and if you, if anybody's had experience with bee boxes and keeping bees, you probably have noticed that at the entrance to a bee box, you will see bees. And these bees essentially are heterogeneously uh, placed uh, at that entrance. Uh, and they also face uh, uh, inwards and uh, uh, basically blow air out. So they suck air from inside out. So there's an active ventilation process associated uh, with keeping the temperature in the hive lower than some critical value and keeping it oxygenated, which is very important for brood care. So I told you about cooperative brood care being very important. <clears throat> and this is work that was started by Jake Peters, a uh, graduate student finished with me a couple of years ago now at Cornell and Oret Peleg who was a postdoc and she's now a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Okay, so if you uh, go back to whatever else you were doing uh, over the next hour, I'd like you to remember just one thing, which is the entire story associated with what I will describe, uh, namely that in both these problems, and in fact, a large class of these problems that we and others have studied, uh, uh, what seems to be happening is that these agents, in this case, either the termites or the bees, essentially use a very simple algorithm, uh, which is associated with just local sensing and local actuation. In this case, local sensing would be potentially associated with pheromone sensing over here with either temperature, I'll show you evidence for that, or uh, um, uh, carbon dioxide um, and local actuation. In this case, you can build associated with pheromone concentrations or, or, or break. Uh, here, you essentially fan or stop fanning. And the physics is global. The physics is global because you essentially are changing the environment. Over here, you're controlling the porosity of a structure. And by controlling the porosity of the structure, you are essentially making a micro niche, uh, a micro environment where you are able to control oxygen, carbon dioxide, temperature, humidity, and so on, much, much better than you would be able to if you were completely in the open. So again, this very beautiful balance between not being completely permeable, uh, but not being completely insulated either, so that you can essentially have some way of regulation. And this, of course, is a fundamental question that all organisms at all scales have had to solve. So both these problems, I'll show you evidence for how local sensing and actuation plus global physics uh, fluid flow uh, and, and passive transport of scalars, whether it's carbon dioxide, oxygen, pheromone, and so on, give rise to both function and give rise to architecture. Function in this case is ventilation. Architecture over here is passive architecture, but it's essentially built actively. Over here, the architecture, if you want, is the spatial temporal organization of bees at the bee box as a function of time of the day or of night, where you're given the architecture. OK, so I want to start with the first problem. Oh, and by the way, I should have said this at the beginning. I would be very happy if you interrupt at any point because otherwise I feel like I'm talking to a colored wall, uh, which is indeed the case, but it'd be nice to pretend that it was not the case. So please do stop me anytime you feel uh, compelled to do so. So termite mounds uh, have of course been observed and, 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 and studied casually for a very, very long time. Uh, they can exist at the individual level. You essentially have colonies of termite mounds. So there is a meta question associated, not just with understanding what happens in a termite mound or how it's built, but how termite mounds themselves essentially create larger scale patterns. Over here, you can see that they're even oriented. Uh, um, they can be a few million in a mound. Uh, each uh, termite is of the order of a few millimeters. So three uh, uh, orders of magnitude larger than themselves. The structures 
that they create. Uh, they're found in every continent except Antarctica. There are more than 3,000 species. Uh, and the kinds of structures that they can build are huge. Uh, most recently, um, there's a beautiful paper published in Current Biology a couple of years ago where these researchers essentially found evidence of a 4,000 year old pattern of termite mounds on a scale comparable to the size of Great Britain. So it's quite remarkable. I mean, these, uh, these, uh, these insects have literally conquered uh, very, very large tracts of land. Um, um, I won't come to this macro problem. I want to focus on the micro and the meso problem, understanding one mound and what it actually does. As I told you, our first uh, site was in India uh, uh, on the campus of an institute that some of you may be familiar with, the National Center for Biological Sciences. And if you walk outside, you will see them. And I was doing this about 15 years ago or so, and I asked some colleagues whether anybody studies this. And they said, they didn't even think about studying this. And so that's how it started. Um, so the mound, the, the, the termite over there is odontotermy is obesis, a uh, few millimeters in length. This is the mound. It's got these flutes. All mounds really don't have flutes. This is one from Southern Africa. Um, uh, we don't um, come ask me the, at the end what these flutes are for. Uh, very quickly now, I, we think it's associated with uh, ventilation and, and ability to essentially radiate heat much more easily because you have fins uh, and therefore higher surface area. I won't tell you much more about that. These mounds are porous. Um, you you, if you break them, you find uh, holes uh, uh, or cores. Uh, they are more channel-like in the middle, uh, much smaller as you come to the periphery. This is a top view. Um, and as I told you before, biologists uh, have essentially speculated uh, for a very, very long time what they may be for from the point of view of physiology and how they are built from the point of view of morphogenesis. And if I look at this in an even larger scale, what are their environmental effects? How do they essentially play a role in the ecology of the system that they are around? Okay, so um, if I try to understand the anatomy before I understand the physiology, uh, this is essentially what a typical mound would look like if I broke it. Uh, in fact, like an iceberg, much of the interesting things, or at least in terms of scale, uh, are happening below um, the ground uh, in this region called the gallery, uh, which can be about a meter or even larger. Uh, uh, so if you have a couple of meters above, you have similar uh, scope below. And so it's very difficult to study the origin. So I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. It's a very interesting question from an ecological uh, uh, perspective to try and use LIDAR or something of that sort to try and understand how these are formed. Uh, you take a saw and you cut it, you see these channels. A uh, colleague of mine, Rupert Soar, basically did a beautiful experiment where he poured gypsum into this, waited for a few days, uh, and then dissolved all the mud, and so you see the skeleton uh, inside corresponding to these long channels, which are essentially pointing in the direction of gravity with some smaller channels uh, away from each other. And of course, you don't see the very small pores on the surface itself. Um, most of the time, most of the termites are below the ground. Uh, so the termites, of course, as I said, stay there. Uh, the brood is also there. And these termites essentially bring uh, food for the brood from outside. So they harvest fungus, bring it over there. And this is most of the time where they live. They do, of course, come to the surface. They repair the surface if there are cracks, if there are breaks. Uh, and that's a way to tell whether a mound is essentially, um, so to speak, alive or not. If it starts to look uh, weather, it's likely that it's essentially been abandoned. And so these mounds which we've broken uh, were abandoned mounds. Uh, and we did experiments both on abandoned ones and live ones, so to speak. I'll come back to that. Um, uh -huh. moved, yeah, question? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a first question. And I actually had a similar one in mind. So this question was, do you have a sense of how long it takes them to build one of these mounds? Is it weeks, yeah. months, or years? And I wanted to add to that because I was intrigued by the fact that you broke off a chunk and I was curious in that sense, how long to heal a wound? So those yeah. are maybe both of those questions. Okay, uh, so, it, so thank you. Um, we know how much time it takes to heal one of the wounds. It can take, depends on the size of the wound, but it can take a few hours. If I have something, let's say the size of a couple of fingers, uh, um, something larger will take a few days. Uh, um, in terms of building a mound, as I said, because the mound starts underground, we are not sure, but the part above the ground can essentially be built in weeks. And this again, depends on the season. Uh, right after the rains, they can build very, very quickly. There's a lot of wet soil and the termites seem to know how to take advantage of that. Uh, if this happens in a different part of the year, it can take much, much longer. And I'm afraid 
that I don't know the variability in this when I go from one continent to the other. Um, okay. So that's I'm, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going because another question came up and I want to add uh, to, to the previous one. So one thing is that um, if you have a wound, what is the time scale for them to know? <laughs> and uh, yeah. then the other the other question was: Is the soil for the mound above the ground obtained from the soil below? For instance, is the mound built from underground to the above ground? You kind of just answered that, but maybe you know somehow from the conservation of mass point of view, it'd be interesting yeah. to know more about that. And then um, the, there's another question, which is also related to repair, which is when they repair, do they make the same pattern again as the original? Oh, let me, let me question. Start. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Let me go start with it. the last question first. So yeah. you know the analogy to a wound is actually very apt because it turns out that there is a fast response. Uh, so there's a squad, if you like, that comes and, res and responds very, very quickly. And in fact, let me see if I can play that right here. Um, so there's a small wound, uh, you know, of the order of a centimeter or a few centimeters. You can see the termites themselves. So, um, and so they can essentially repair a wound. And so what do they respond to? So they respond to um, gas concentration because as soon as you open up a termite mound, locally oxygen carbon dioxide imbalances will change. Um, they also respond to light and they also respond to temperature. We don't know the relative weights of how they respond to these three factors. So there's a colleague of mine, Sanjay Sane, who has been studying this for a few years, uh, um, don't have an answer yet. Um, the answer, uh, and then the analogy to the wound coming back to it. So uh, on short scales, you form something which looks like a scab, literally, and that is remodeled over a period of days to weeks. And if you come back after a period of time, you can't see it at all. So that's what I said, when a mound looks weathered, it's because it's no longer essentially kept up. The question of where they get the soil, um, typically from the neighborhood, different termites seem to have preference for different kinds of soil. In Namibia, they use a mixture of sand and clay. You can actually see, in fact, colorations or differences in color, the gray sand, the more brown clay. In India, just because of what's available, it's mostly clay. They also essentially build with their own bodies. If there are dead termites, they use that. Uh, um, does that begin to answer some of the questions? It does. It's just that the questions are accumulating. And, and in the spirit of, I totally get you, it's really weird to sit and give a talk just to your computer screen in some room you've been sitting in for five months. So I figure it's more fun if people interrupt you. So uh, maybe Ernan will, uh, he, he, I yeah. think he was also looking at the question. Yeah, so. if you can call it, combine, however you feel like, please do. Um, yeah, may go, I continue for, for a bit? Well, I mean, one related to the regeneration process is like when you when you talk about wound healing, is it does the pattern look the same after they they rebuild or they regenerate? Um, the surface can look essentially as if it's uncorrupted. I am almost certain the interior will not, and I'm going oh. to show you some evidence of that a little later. Not yeah. associated with the regeneration. That's just a very difficult problem to study. These large mounds, nobody's been able to essentially get them make termites to make in the lab. There are baby versions of this that people have tried. Um, you do get microscopic disorder. Uh, you get, you know, sort of randomness at that scale. The large scale patterns seem to persist. And if you will wait, I will show you what those large scale patterns look like in, in maybe 10, 15 minutes or so. Okay, got it. And um, and then one, one question is kind of related to the, um, you know, is there some is there some reflection of the characteristic of the soil and the structure of the mound? And also, are these how dynamics are, the, are these structures? They, they, it looks like they're constantly being kept up. Do they yes. actually change in shape in response to, let's say, weather, season? The, macro, the like macroscopic that? shapes do not seem to change. Uh, the large channels are preserved. Microscopically, uh, they do change. But as I said, these are extremely difficult questions to study in the right. field because you need to essentially instrument a mound be able to see through it on very long times, on days, weeks, and months. So I think the short answer is we don't know. The lab studies with you know, small Petri dishes or slightly larger Petri dishes with uh, well-sifted clay and termites, you can start to see some of this, but you don't see any of the macroscopic structures. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, maybe we should keep going a little bit and then okay. we'll, we'll keep interrupting you. So I wanted to show this video, which I will play again, uh, just because you can see essentially what is happening. As I said, they're responding to multiple cues. Okay, so if these are structures for ventilation, a very natural question is, how do they work? And if indeed they're for ventilation, 
The second question that arises after that is, how does a termite build it? Is there a master plan? I'll tell you right now, it doesn't seem to be. If there is no master plan, how does this structure, how does architecture evolve? And to address the first question, um, I can't think of anybody more eloquent than one of my favorite naturalists, uh, probably one of everybody's favorite naturalists, uh, at least on TV, uh, this man. Here in South Africa, it can also get very hot, but there's no danger of flooding. So termites can take refuge from the heat below ground where it's cool and relatively stable. But two million insects living below ground create a different kind of problem. The air around them gets stale. So termites need to have a way of linking the underground air with the fresh air above, a ventilation system. And they do that with this. And to see how it works, you've got to look inside. Forgive their dramatization. Using the latest scanning techniques, we can create a picture of the mound's interior. An intricate network of passages lead to a central chimney. Hot, stale air from the insect population below rises up through the chimney. But the top of the mound is sealed. So how does this stale air escape? The mound may look as though it has strong defensive walls like a fortress, but in fact, these walls are porous and their primary purpose is to harness the wind. Fresh air blowing against the side of the mound is forced through the tiny holes in these walls. From there, it travels through the smaller tunnels until it reaches the central chimney. Here, the cooler fresh air mixes with the hot stale air rising from the insect community below. Meanwhile, some air is blown around the side of the mound. This creates a suction that pulls the stale air out of the chimney and out through the outer walls. So an internal air current is created and the whole mound ventilated. The mound's inhabitants spend most of their time close to or below ground level. Okay, so it seems like David Attenborough has basically told us the whole thing, say something, mumbling something about Bernoulli and saying that if I have flows around curved uh, objects, uh, the curvature in the streamline changes the pressure and therefore I have suction. Is that it? Um, you think about it for a little bit and you start wondering whether that's really it. And there are multiple reasons, but the simplest one is he mentioned something about the fact that the air can get in, but I actually showed you the mountain. You can see it in front of you in the pictures, the walls, have very, very low porosity close to their boundary, even though the porosity increases as you go inward. So there's a gradient in porosity. And if there is a gradient in porosity, this porous medium acts actually as a filter and it's a low pass filter, high frequency uh, uh, information associated with turbulent flows on the outside will not propagate, uh, they will get damped out, low frequency information might get in. Um, and so if it's only low frequency information that might get in, is that sufficient uh, in order for you to essentially ventilate it. So there's only one way to find out, which is to essentially do experiments. Uh, and the surprising thing is that in fact, these experiments were done qualitatively, but not quantitatively 30, 40 years ago. And this picture that Attenborough presented is pretty much now seems to be, or was uh, until a few years ago, uh, what everybody thought was correct. Uh, and I'm gonna now tell you what that picture is a little more quantitatively. And I'm gonna tell you about some experiments which suggest that in fact, that's not true. And so we've got to revisit that problem or revisit that question. So if I'm thinking about you know, uh, flow through a porous uh, uh, medium, a disordered porous medium, um, I can think about whether or not there is diffusion through this medium, and I can also think about whether there is flow. Diffusion, of course, is random, uh, no orientation, and flow would be essentially directed. Um, and so you can quantify both these things. You just take away, break away a chunk of this from different locations. Uh, um, these experiments were done with mounds uh, in, um, India, uh, and I'll show you later on experiments were done similarly with mounds from Namibia. And if you look at, for example, the, the flow associated with the pressure gradient, so here is the pressure gradient, here is a flow, uh, here is a typical velocity of the order of not even a millimeter a second for uh, a hundredth of an atmosphere of pressure. So, you know, atmosphere, um, atmospheric pressure is of the order of uh, 
uh, 10 to the five Pascals, so a couple of orders of magnitude larger than this. Uh, and the typical fluctuations in the atmospheric pressure would be of the, this kind of order. And so you get velocities of the order of about a millimeter per second, which is very, very small if I want to try and evacuate something. So, you know, bear that number in mind. And then the second question that you can ask is from a diffusion point of view, if I had a difference in concentration between the inside and the outside, how quickly will that essentially stabilize? And so that's associated now with not a directed flow, but with just a relaxation. And that relaxation time can take of the order of hours. So these are relatively slow processes, particularly because the mound is of the order of uh, 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 hundreds of centimeters in size. Uh, so maybe there is diffusive exchange, but flow is very small. So hold that thought in mind. Um, a different kind of approach, uh, rather than thinking about the transfer of material, uh, a different kind of approach was associated with this turbulent uh, uh, drive. Uh, so Scott Turner, uh, um, very cre cre excuse me, creative entomologist, uh, uh, tried to do some experiments where he essentially took cooking gas and then introduced them at one location and tried to essentially look for, uh, using sensors, look for it at different locations in the presence and absence of flows, in this case, external flows, uh, um, and showed that, as I said before, you expect that there is a filtering process at play where if I have these fine scale pores on the boundary, much of the high frequency information gets filtered, only the low frequency information goes through. So he was able to show that there is some filtering. Um, that's one approach uh, or one, one thought, and he's been pushing that for a couple of decades. Uh, another approach is to recognize, uh, which is much older, is to recognize that the mounds are in fact inhabited uh, by millions of inhabitants. Uh, and very famous German entomologist, Lucher essentially proposed a different idea. And the different idea is that these termites are of course metabolically active. As I said before, they spend most of their time in the gallery below the ground. If they're metabolically active, they are sources of heat, they are sources uh, of, of, of carbon dioxide. And could it be, and this was a suggestion that he made, could it be that metabolism inside the mound essentially is driving these flows? Okay, so we have to then ask ourselves about this balance or competition between what is happening on the micro scale associated with diffusion and flow and on the macro scale associated with potentially either a graded porous medium working as a low pass filter and on top of that, or having separately active metabolically driven flows. These uh -huh. very, very different flow profiles. Yep, question. Yeah, um, I, I, it makes me wonder whether there's an interesting dimensionless number to be had. Okay, come to that. Okay. Um, yes, so, so very, very simply, may I just tell you right now, there's a Peclet number, okay? So the Peclet number would be the velocity multiplied by characteristic uh, scale divided by the diffusivity. How do you get a velocity? Uh, if it's metabolically driven, you get a velocity because of temperature gradients. And so you get a velocity from buoyancy because as soon as I heat a gas, it essentially expands. Uh, and if it expands, that expansion will reduce the density, you want it to rise. Um, so balancing buoyancy with viscosity will give you a characteristic speed. That speed multiplied by the size of the mound gives you something which has a dimension of diffusion and that balance with the effective diffusion of the gas itself will tell you what the relative magnitudes are of flow and diffusion of transfer and of transport. Uh, but yeah, I, I was going to say that um, I find it a little weird that diffusion shows up because, you know, like the whole story of perfume across the room or something, you know, it's not really legitimate diffusion, I think. That, yeah, but that's because that this I, is a porous medium. You're thinking about an open medium, so it's fundamentally different. Okay. So in a porous medium, diffusion can uh, be comparable to um, uh, a flow because it's uh, because flow is massively hindered because it's not the bare flow, it's the flow modulated by the permeability. You're absolutely right. In the air, you know, the Peclet number would be very, very large because diffusion plays no role. You smell the perfume because of the flow, but in a porous yeah. medium, it's a little more tricky. Not tricky, it's actually simpler. I, I didn't know that. That's great. Thank you for telling me. Okay. All right, so anyway, so these suggested, these ideas suggested that there is need for a careful experiment. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, we wanted to measure in situ in the field because you can't build these in the lab. Um, and so we used an old idea modified just a tiny bit, uh, which is standard in hydrodynamics, standard in, in measuring air flows and fluid flows, which is to use a hot wire or a hot uh, bead uh, anemometer. And the idea is 
that if I basically have a current move through a resistor, then uh, it becomes hot. If it becomes hot, then of course it heats the air around it. And if it heats the air around it, that air is going to become buoyant and it's going to move. And as it moves, if there is another resistor, which is my sensor, uh, the temperature in that resistor is going to change. And as a function of that temperature, the resistance is going to change. And therefore I can essentially measure how much flow there is um, and uh, uh, get a sense of what is happening in the interior. Unfortunately, that's the standard way. Unfortunately, if I use just a standard two wire anemometer, I'm not gonna get anything more than a scalar because it just tell me, oh, if I switch this on or switch this off, I'm gonna be able to get a certain amount of time lag after which I will get a signal. So we basically use a three wire uh, anemometer so that we can essentially get not only the speed, but the direction. With two wires, of course, you can get the direction, but then you could also switch which one is the activator and which one is the sensor over here. We always use the actuator in the center so we can get the speed and the direction. And furthermore, we can essentially do experiments where we pulse current through it and therefore give a bolus of heat and therefore of hot air, or we can work at steady state. So we can basically look at the transient dynamics, but we can also look at the steady state dynamics and couple all this to an Arduino and a laptop and we can go off, uh, and this is what Hunter, Sam, uh, and I did when we went to Namibia a few years ago. So you can essentially make these measurements in the field or in India. With one small problem, you have about five minutes to make the measurement. I mentioned before, and I showed you an image, and this was a question that came up, what would happen if you wound the mound? And the termites would come swarming to essentially shut the mound. Uh, and so our way of essentially making this measurement was to take a drill, make holes in the mound at different locations. We don't have access deep inside. We have only access on the surface. Uh, um, stick your finger in. Uh, if you, you can actually feel if the mound is, if the, if the hole that you have is, uh, that you've reached, uh, the channel that you've reached is uh, active because if you just wet your finger, you can essentially get a sense of whether there is airflow or not. If there's no airflow, that's a dead channel. Forget about it. If there is, uh, uh, um, uh, a sense that you have of the airflow, then you stick your probe in, this probe uh, that I'm showing you, sorry, I'm pointing with my finger, this probe over here, and within five minutes, they clog it. And they'll kill, uh, they'll sacrifice themselves and or clay um, because they essentially sense an invasion. And so within five minutes, you have to make the measurement, um, which means that you do this multiple times, okay? So we do this at multiple locations uh, along the boundary of the mound, near the base, near the surface. Uh, we do this during the day, we do this during the night. And so I wanna emphasize, we have therefore information about flow along the boundary. You can also get little buttons which you can stick in whenever you do this uh, um, and measure the temperature. Uh, and you can also measure the temperature outside. So what we wanted to do is to measure uh, and then simultaneously, you can also use carbon dioxide sensor. So we can measure carbon dioxide as a function of location along the boundary. We can measure temperature. And of course, we can measure flow. And I want to now show you what the data look like, both for a live mound, one which we know is active, and one which is not active. And again, how do we know that it's not active? Nothing happens if we leave our probes inside for a long time. And so here's what we see. So um, this is midday, this is midnight, uh, 6 p.m., 6 a.m., should be wrapped around. Um, and this is the airspeed, positive is airspeed on the surface inside the walls, positive is upwards, negative is downwards. Uh, um, focus on the red dashed curve first, and the red dashed curve is showing you temperature, and no surprises, this is India, as I said before. Um, the hottest time of the day is, uh, a couple of hours uh, afternoon, um, and uh, this is a diurnal cycle. This is essentially the same as that. Uh, and if you look at now the speed of the air, uh, our sensors got saturated uh, at the bottom over here. This is centimeters per second. Uh, and at the top you see essentially, so there's positive flow um, upwards during the day and at night here and here after dusk, there is negative flow. So the picture that you should have is that within the mound, this is not outside the mound, this is within the mound, low porosity walls, you go you know, a couple of centimeters in, airflow during the day is moving up, no surprises there, hot air is buoyant, it's moving up. Remember, and Attenborough talked about this, and I wanna remind you again, there is no chimney, the whole thing is closed at the top as well, so if airflow is going up along the inside, along in the, in the periphery, it of course through continuity must be going down in the center. So during the day, that's what we have. And at night, it's essentially reversed because you have now everything 
going backwards. And you've already now guessed how this is happening because you're essentially now being driven by the diurnal cycle, no more and no less. Uh, you can estimate the speed very, very crudely. I told you this is a porous medium which has multiple scales. Uh, uh, and so just very crudely thinking about the characteristic scale as the order of a few millimeters, balance uh, buoyancy with viscosity, uh, alpha thermal coefficient of expansion, delta T is the temperature variation, rho and G density and gravity, and you get something of the right order of magnitude. So very, very crude estimate using a calculation which goes back at least to Rayleigh. Um, so right ballpark and very suggestive that in fact, temperature variations in the environment are critical. Check that, we go to a dead unoccupied mound and you see exactly the same thing, okay? So you see that the temperature again um, is uh, peaking in this case, this is one, one sample uh, peaking around noon, uh, but you see over here, the flow is essentially tracking that remarkably well. So no termites, uh, no metabolic activity, similar things, are, similar things are seen over here. You look at carbon dioxide and you see something very interesting. So uh, again, dawn, dusk, midday, midnight, uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration near the base on the periphery, uh, clearly all generated in the gallery, eventually diffusing or advection driven by advection because of the flows, uh, increases. And then slightly after dusk, look at this and look at that. Slightly after dusk, the whole thing falls. Um, so what's happening? So a picture that this is suggesting is that these large scale convection flows inside the mound uh, serve to essentially mix up the air in the interior and also serve to excavate what is essentially happening uh, in the gallery. And when will excavation be maximal? Excavation will be maximal when you have overturning rather than have a steady state. In a steady state, you'll have a small boundary layer, which is essentially being excavated, but that's it. But when you have overturning flows, typically you will get very, very large scale mixing. And that large scale mixing will mean that you essentially excavate carbon dioxide from near the base, therefore coming from the gallery. And that leads to this dramatic decrease. So, so the picture that this suggests is that in fact, the mound is actually working like a lung, but except in our lung, rather than having a diaphragm, which is essentially continuously muscularly actuating uh, and expanding and, and, and deflating the lungs, um, over here, that oscillation is a temperature oscillation. And that temperature oscillation is giving rise to the mound breathing literally once a day, okay? Is that consistent crudely with imaging? And the short answer is yes. I think I showed you this image a little while ago. This is the mound uh, uh, using regular optical imaging. Uh, these ellipses are there to orient you along so that you're considering things along the flute. Uh, this is during the day, very hot flutes, not surprisingly, easy to heat, very, very thin, low thermal mass, uh, low thermal capacity, very quickly will respond to temperature variations. Uh, during the day, but also will respond to temperature variations in the other direction at night, okay? So they become cool also faster. So heating and cooling the surface leads to changes in the way in which air flows in the interior. And so this is an engine, but unlike the engines, almost universally that we think about in technology, this is an engine which is essentially driven by a source and a sink, which is fluctuating in time, or actually in this case, periodic in time rather than thinking about the classic picture where I have a source and a sink at a given temperature, given temperatures over here, this is a large scale version of an engine driven by, unlike the small scale engines, which again, people in, in, in the course are very familiar with, this is a large scale engine driven by essentially oscillations in the environment, in this case of temperature. All right, so it's a passive diurnal lung. Um, it suggests an interesting experiment to be done in the lab, which I won't tell you about. Can we reconstruct this in a lab with a simple tube where we heat and cool two parts of the tube and see whether we can essentially drive uh, uh, circulating flow, which reverses by essentially having temporal variation. So change time into space. And that's exactly what's happening over here. So I have oscillations in time, which are converted to oscillations in space and time. How general is this mechanism? I told you about odontotermy is obesis in India. Um, that's very tropical. Uh, these termite mounds typically are in, in these tree-laden zones, for example, in Bangalore. Uh, in Namibia, it's much more temperate, uh, so further south, uh, uh, close to 
um, uh, well, you can see right here, uh, boundary between um, Namibia and um, uh, Angola. Um, um, same thing, uh, but different in a couple of uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, you're much further south from the equator. And so you expect to see that as you basically go from uh, uh, dawn to dusk and the next day, the sun kind of orbits the uh, mound. Uh, and when you see the temperature, indeed, you see that different parts of the mound are heated at different times. So the simple axisymmetric picture that I was trying to essentially widely gesticulate is not quite correct because now you have azimuthal variations as well. This is much more open land. And uh, so you would expect higher temperature variations between night and day. I should have pointed out, let me just see if I can. Uh, temperature variations out of the order of a few degrees over here, six degrees or so. Uh, if I go to, uh, when we went to Namibia, uh, temperature variations are now more like 15 degrees, much, much larger. Okay, uh, open. And similarly, the velocities. And again, our uh, sensors saturated over here, but look at the value. This is now double the velocity, six centimeters, and it's still not quite saturated, and it's, sorry, still not being able to capture things. Similarly, uh, the positive velocity can be at least five or six centimeters. And so again, if I look down on the mound, now different parts are essentially getting heated at different times. Uh, and so you get this phase lag. So you essentially get this rotating convection in addition to the circulating convection. So it's more like a torus, which is broken symmetry. Same, so same mechanism, different species, uh, different temperatures um, or temperature variations, similar we think the same thing is happening with one exception, which we don't understand at all, which is if you look at the carbon dioxide, uh, you can see that the carbon dioxide variations now are tracking. So a thought that is that that tracking is associated with these much, much larger mixing flows because it's not like you're heating the entire mound and cooling the entire mound uniformly, you're heating and cooling different parts. And as a consequence, you're getting much more complex flows. And if you have much more complex flows, perhaps you're able to excavate the gallery and therefore carbon dioxide is keeping track of temperature uh, because temperature is driving flow. Okay. Maha, so I have a question from the yeah. audience. Uh, yeah. What is the role of porosity in the diurnal lung model? So the porosity is what controls the velocity and the gradient in porosity therefore controls the gradient in velocity. So you'll have low velocities near the wall and high velocities in the interior. So, um, so let, me, let me make that even more quantitative and I'll make that quantitative in a theory in a minute, but first at the level of scaling, porosity is what is essentially going to replace this characteristic pore size R over here. So I should strictly write this as R squared times some function of the porosity, F of phi and F of phi, when I go from the wall, if phi is the solid volume fraction, phi is close to one, very, very low porosity. And as I go further and further into the interior, the porosity increases. We have not, in this very simple picture, accounted for that. Does that address the question? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, question: um, How do they build this? Okay. So, if this evidence is convincing that in fact the mound works as a very simple ventilator, but the ventilator driven for any ventilator to work. So there's an interesting question uh, in, in humans compared to, for example, birds compared to insects. You know, when do you need a ventilation system? Very small organisms, diffusion is good enough. You can essentially do all your transport uh, uh, using diffusion because the characteristic time will scale as the size of the organism squared divided by diffusion. You become bigger, you need to essentially build uh, a ventilator. Um, you can build a ventilator like we have, where we use essentially the same uh, uh, um, um, mechanism for exhalation, sorry, the same uh, conduit for exhalation and inhalation, or you could do something different. Birds, for example, have a much different way of essentially achieving ventilation. They need higher oxygen uh, rates uh, uh, because of the uh, very large uh, metabolic consumption associated with flight. And so they have something which is much less um, oscillatory and much more continuous. Uh, here is a solution where you have this global oscillation, which gives rise to a spatiotemporal oscillation, which then when it flips once a day, seems to essentially help excavate. But how do they build this? And in particular, I mentioned before, and I wanna come back to this now, if I wanted to build an engine, 
of this kind uh, to essentially harness temporal variations in this case of temperature, I must not have a thermal mass which is either too big or too small. Because if the thermal mass is too big, the interior will never feel anything on a diurnal cycle associated 24 hours. And if it's too small, it's going to essentially equilibrate too quickly. And therefore, again, you will have no gradients. So the critical idea or the critical thing that these organisms have learned how to figure out is to recognize that there is a characteristic scale above which things are not going to work because the interior is essentially going to be dead. So this is the equivalent of tissue which becomes necrotic unless I build a ventilator or a circulating uh, uh, vascularization system. Uh, and if it's too small, um, you don't have all the advantages of collective behavior. So what's going on? So that was our second question. And I see that I'm, I have five minutes. I won't tell you about bees, but I will try and finish with termites, which is good. Um, how are they built? So I want to first provide sort of a well, clue. You can, you can go like, let's say until, uh, I don't know, like 10, 10 after, just keep going. I'm not saying necessarily you should do the bees, but just feel free to okay. proceed because okay. you know we've been interrupting you all. Though there are a lot of questions uh, Erin and I are still, we're trying to deal with something because they're not coming in order. So it's okay. a little hard to parse them. Anyway, keep going. So, so very natural question is, how do you build that? I mean, if they, if they work passively, but that we built actively. So how can you essentially understand, or can you understand something about how they're built? And I propose in the time that I have, I want to suggest, um, how do I move this? I want to suggest first a crude approximation to understand just the structure, which means the size and the shape of a mound. And then if I have time, I'll zoom in and I'll tell you what the structure looks like inside, both of which are, I think are questions which have come up. Um, okay, <clears throat> so, so how do we understand this? Okay, so um, here is a cartoon and um, here is a quote and I'll start with the quote. Um, uh, Churchill famously said, um, I think before the war uh, that we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So somehow saying that we change the environment uh, and when we change the environment, the environment changes our behavior, which I think all of us can actually see right now over the last four months, sitting in front of a screen. is not something uh, that it was ever planned for, but you know, the environment changed, environment then changed our behavior and our behavior then changes the environment. So that's the picture in a nutshell. So what's happening? So um, whatever mound morphology you have, uh, it's a porous structure, maybe very complicated because of porosity gradients. Maybe the porosity gradients are anisotropic because of the presence of gravity. I'll come back to that. But whatever it is, that mound morphology controls the local uh, uh, transformation uh, or transfer of information, matter, and energy. Information associated with pheromone concentration. That pheromone concentration, of course, is now moved around through uh, the flow of fluid, and that then changes the behavior of, mount, of termites, which essentially move material around. When they move material around in response to these olfactory cues, uh, the termite behavior then changes the mount morphology, and this loop essentially goes around. So from a physics point of view, if you want, we can't anymore say, oh, this is physics and this is biology, because you know, that won't work. Uh, we've got to basically combine them, and we've got to ask, is there some sort of non-equilibrium steady state associated with this cycle? And so I want to propose an idea uh, consistent with this at a minimal level with the aim of understanding what sets the size and the shape of the mound. So here is a cartoon where the three variables, which we now know experimentally are relevant, uh, are the diurnal temperature variations. In addition, of course, there are seasonal variations. I will not worry about that. Uh, so there are diurnal temperature variations, which can be a function of one variable S, second variable Z, I'm thinking about axisymmetry. I know that termite mounds are not always axisymmetric, but this is to keep things simple. A second variable, which is essentially the pheromone concentration, also a field, which varies as a function of space and time. And a third variable, which is essentially the velocity of the fluid, which is driven by buoyancy, which is essentially driven by temperature. So that's the fundamental, these are the fundamental variables or the, uh, uh, if you want fancy language, or the parameters, which should essentially be coupled to each other. And here is the cartoon. Okay, so whatever shape I have, uh, I have these diurnal oscillations in temperature. These diurnal oscillations in temperature essentially change the uh, flow inside the mound. Uh, when they change the flow inside the mound, the pheromone, and I'm going to be very, very agnostic to what the actual pheromone is. Actually, we don't know. It could be something as simple as not a real pheromone. It could be humidity. Insects are very sensitive to variations in humidity, uh, but it could be something much more specific, like a whole class of cement pheromones, which have been well known. Uh, to be uh, attributed with growth. Uh, 
And these pheromones then move around because of the presence of, uh, of, uh, of airflow. And if the pheromone concentration is large in the critical value, it's known termites will build. If it's smaller than critical value, then the termites will essentially shrink. So they'll just pull the material in. And so that will then change your environment. When you change your environment and you're subject to this oscillating temperature field, you will change the flow. Coming back to a question that was asked, that changes the porosity. And then this whole process continues. Question, can you reach a steady state? non-equilibrium steady state, okay? So here is a tiny bit of mathematics, uh, very simple, um, where you have a diurnal oscillation with a characteristic temperature amplitude and a characteristic frequency, which is essentially a day. <clears throat> that diurnal temperature variation gives rise to buoyancy variations and the buoyancy variations essentially give rise to flow. And this is my very simple model for flow through a porous medium. That is why I have a linear fluid model. And that actually helps us rather than solve the full very complicated nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations. We are, are, are completely fine because I'm thinking about flow in a porous media as being driven by buoyancy and the balance between velocity and pressure gradient. Kappa is this permeability. I was calling it R squared. Now kappa is a complicated function or it could be a complicated function. And of course the fluid is incompressible. So the fluid is driven by temperature. Um, that fluid then advects the temperature inside the mound. This is a boundary condition. This is the boundary condition associated with heating the wall. This is what is happening inside. Flow is being advected and diffused. Uh, turns out diffusions are important because the velocities can be quite large, certainly in the vertical direction. And you already see something obvious from these equations is why are termite mounds vertical, not horizontal? Because gravity breaks symmetry. As soon as I have gravity, I get buoyancy. As soon as I get buoyancy, I get vertical flow. As soon as I get vertical flow, I get large uh, abilities to essentially move the pheromone up and down, but not at all in the horizontal direction. And so you see that an aspect ratio develops just because of a broken symmetry associated with gravity with gives rise to buoyancy. And I'll come back to that quantitatively. And then finally, the pheromones are being moved around passively so the rate of change of the pheromone is because of advection, because of diffusion. Again, diffusion is not important. It's mostly advection. And then finally, there is a source. And the source of pheromones is all the termites or all the termites in the gallery. Pheromones will equilibrate relatively quickly. It's gas equilibrates very quickly. So in, in a limit, which corresponds to essentially the, the uh, uh, diffusivity and or the flow associated with the pheromones basically being fast, this equation can go uh, be equilibrated. So, so far it's just physics. There's no biology. Where is the biology coming? In one place. Very simple idea. That's our templating rule. We know lots of observations that show that if the pheromone concentration is larger than the critical value you build, in this case, you build outwards. And if the pheromone concentration is smaller than critical value, you shrink. That's it. So this is the only place where behavior comes in. But because phi is controlled by diffusivity and flow, and flow is controlled by permeability, which is controlled by temperature, everything sort of couples back to the physics. You can't think about the organism on its own. You have to think about the whole system. So coming back to a question that I think multiple people had, what are the parameters and what are the conclusions from the parameters? What are the scales? So there is a wall, I told you, which has very low permeability. In this case, we just assumed the wall has a very low permeability and the rest of it has a uniform uh, reasonably high permeability. You can build models which have now gradients of permeability, but that would involve more complex functions, so we didn't do that. We also assumed axis symmetry, which I recognize is only the first step. There is a characteristic length scale, which is associated with what I told you before. How quickly does the temperature on the wall equilibrate, or how far into the interior does it get felt? So this is a thermal boundary layer, and that scale is controlled by this period of the uh, oscillations, one over omega, and the thermal diffusivity, which we know. There is buoyancy, which is essentially controlling the relative magnitude of flow in the vertical direction compared to diffusion. And then finally, there is a pheromone penetration length. If I have a source of pheromone at the gallery, how far out will it penetrate so that you reach a critical concentration, even in the absence of anything more complicated? Just because I'm spreading that pheromone on a larger and larger volume, then at a critical radius, that pheromone concentration will go right, give go down below phi star, and so beyond that, you're not going to build. So this already tells you what the horizontal extent of the mound is in this very simple model, and the vertical extent is going to be controlled by buoyancy. 
Okay, so from these scales, I can construct some parameters, a Peclet number, which is the balance between or imbalance between uh, flow and diffusion, a thermal analog of that, which is essentially telling you how thick or thin the wall is compared to the pheromone penetration length, and a second uh, uh, a quantity, which is telling you about the length scale associated with buoyancy, uh, sorry, with, with uh, excuse me, with thermal diffusion compared to the size of the um, uh, location where phi becomes phi star. You can simulate those equations uh, uh, for different choices of these parameters for real, val for real, uh, in the real world, these parameters, one of them is small, one of them is large, sorry, small and order one. So you start to see a system which, I mean, this, the, the solution doesn't look too bad. Uh, it does reach this non-equilibrium steady state. And why does it reach a steady state? Because you can't essentially grow any further outwards since you can't get the concentration of the pheromone to become large further outwards. And similarly in the vertical direction, depending on the temperature. An observation that's an old observation is that the mounds in India can be of the order of about two meters or so. The mounds in Africa can be three and a half, four meters. Again, at least qualitatively consistent with this really simple idea that once I have large temperature variations, I get large flows. Once I have large flows in the vertical direction, I break symmetry much more strongly. And that broken symmetry much more strongly would mean that the aspect ratios would change. And this is what we see. Okay. Hey, Maha, Maha we should probably wrap up in the next three minutes or so. Okay. Yep. So from this, uh, I won't get into the details. You can essentially construct a scaling law for the aspect ratio and for the building time. No surprises, the building time, the only time scale in this problem, if I forget seasonal variations, is the inverse frequency of the diurnal cycle, but then it's magnified or modified by this characteristic ratio of the thermal diffusion to the size uh, over which you feel the pheromone concentration. You can get phase diagrams, which tell you about different kinds of mounds. Uh, and if you look very qualitatively, there's nothing quantitative about this. They are not, I, I'm, only, I'm going to use a double negative, they are not inconsistent with what is observed. Okay, I want to stop uh, with one last slide, if I might, because now I want to tell you about what looks, what the termite mounds look like in the interior. So these are observations, uh, remarkable observations from the group of Gita uh, uh, in Toulouse, um, where he and his colleagues have been studying termite mounds for now more than a decade. And what they go is, uh, what they do is they go and pick them up from different parts of the world. In this case, actually, mostly from West Africa. Um, and then they CAT scan them and they want to see what the interior looks like. Um, and uh, I think someone asked the question about what the structure looks like in, in the interior. So some of these mounds are remarkably regular, unlike the ones that I showed you, the very large ones. So to give you a sense, I, oh, there is a length scale over here. So these are very small termite mounds and these are actually seen in trees. They are seen on branches, very small. And notice that they're also closer to being spherical, which is consistent because they are small, you don't have enough space for a, a strong effect of gravity. If you don't have enough space for a strong effect of gravity, then you expect there is no difference in the horizontal compared to the vertical, and therefore you expect things which are relatively spherical. So I want to spend one minute telling you about some work which we've just finished, um, where we took some of Guy's uh, remarkable scans of these termite mounds, which show, coming back to again a question, which show very characteristic defects, which I, I know people over here in this audience know very well, appear on a completely different scale, nine orders of magnitude smaller in the ER, for example, where you get linear ramps, where you get helical ramps, which essentially connect these different floors. And the question is, how do you get there? Guy had constructed an agent-based model for this a few years ago uh, with Alex Hyde, we constructed a continuum framework. Uh, same idea, uh, collective motion uh, is basically what's moving the mud around. Uh, when the mud is being moved around, the termites also secrete pheromones. That pheromone essentially leads to templating. That templating then changes the way the termites move. And again, you have this cycle, except now we have a microscopic picture where we're thinking about the nest material being inhomogeneously distributed. The workers which are having, which have mud and don't have mud uh, are also inhomogeneous, as is the pheromone. Okay, so you can write down equations for how the mud nest settles down slowly under the influence of gravity when it's wet um, and the mound workers essentially move around in response to the pheromone and also in response to whether there is mud or whether there isn't mud because the pheromones and the muds are very tightly connected since these pheromones turn out to be extremely non-volatile. 
I won't get into the details. And you can essentially see from calculation simulations that Alex High did that you actually pick up both ramps and these helicoidal structures, linear ramps and helicoidal structures uh, with uh, parameters which we know from Gi, which give you numbers which are at least not inconsistent with the data. Okay, so I am out of time, so I'm sorry. I, I'm not gonna be able to tell you about bees, but I want to basically, can I show you one slide and then I'll stop. Uh, in bees, I mentioned this problem associated with hydrodynamics uh, and ventilation. I didn't get a chance to talk about it. There are problems associated with active elastodynamics, active thermodynamics and active hydrodynamics, all of which can and should be studied. And we've begun to play with these and understanding how collective behavior changes structures which change the behavior and eventually the structures and the behavior lead to these non-equilibrium steady states. Uh, same thing that I said in the beginning, I said this before, uh, I will stop here. All right. Thank you. Very Thank much. you so much. Uh, yeah, so what Rob? Uh, I was just saying it'd be fun to just keep going, but there's no yeah. time. Well, let's see, there's a lot of questions. We're not gonna be able to go through all of them, but one, one thread I saw in a many questions is our general concern about what happens when it rains with pores getting clogged and such. That's not a so problem. I don't know. Pores getting okay. clogged is not a problem. These, because there are so many pores and this is a large system, you have a lot of redundancy. When things okay. break, you change porosity. So the question is on what scale are you changing porosity compared, compared to the system scale? So if I have a gradient in porosity, the gradient in porosity is an inverse length. I want to basically ask, what is that length compared to the size of the system? Recognize that these mounds are sort of very macroscopic compared to the organism. The organism is a few millimeters, the mound is a couple of meters, three orders of magnitude. That would be like you and me. I don't know, what is the tallest building? The Burj Khalifa is, how, how tall is it? It's a few hundred meters. Um, mm -hmm. So we are thinking about something which is two kilometers large and basically completely built without any plan or planner. We've been thinking about experiments here at Harvard in the winter, which we haven't got permission to do, where we want to essentially open and close windows at random and see what <laughs> we can do better than having all this fancy HVAC system where you get very large gradients internally because my metabolism is very different from my neighbor's metabolism. Um, but if there is a message, it is, yeah, I'll stop there actually. There is no message. <laughs> <laughs> um... A question that came in, um, but I think maybe you answered this with the agent-based model you were showing earlier, because the first model that you showed when, where you were trying to figure out whether this was in a, a non-equilibrium steady state is, uh, was how does a more local structure such as those little fin-like structures uh, arise? So as I said, our model was actually symmetric. And so an actual question which we have not done uh, or looked at is to basically ask, now if I introduce perturbations which are non axisymmetric, symmetric, what would happen? And I can give you an reasonable, I think, intuition for why non axisymmetry can, if temperature gradients are large enough, break axisymmetry. And that's because if I have a temperature, if I have an, a non axisymmetric shape, I have a non axisymmetric conductivity. And so therefore regions which are hot become hotter and regions which are cold become colder. And so that's positive feedback, so it'll run away. Why do you see that in India and why do you not see that in Africa? I don't have an answer. Uh, I don't know enough about the, either the structure of the clay or the details of the behavior right now to be able to make a guess. But, I, but the intuition for why it happens, perhaps I at least been able to transmit even if you don't agree. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, that, it, conf, in, ending on a point of ignorance, I think is a very good scientific way to end <laughs> because it tells us that- Ignorance is always point. infinite. It's always going to be infinite. Uh, yeah, no, I know. Uh, it's just, uh, it's good to finish with, I don't know. Um, so thanks again. That was, as always, really just such a pleasure. So we're deeply appreciative you came and chatted with us. And uh, just for everyone that's left on the call, uh, tomorrow morning we have Julie Terrio, and uh, that should be a lot of fun. And otherwise, I uh, send you off with good wishes for the day. And thanks again, Maha. I wish we were uh, able to connect in person. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Great talk, Maha.
拜拜，拜拜，谢谢。